Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the best of from the month of June 2023 from the Innovators Mindset podcast. And I'm really excited you could be here with me today, that you have taken time out of your busy schedule. And I hope wherever you are, you're getting some rest, some time to relax. And that's why I really will love this opportunity to share these incredible guests, some of the highlights from the month, because I, I really love the opportunity to be able to just expose my audience to new people, to new ideas. I did some solo podcasts this last month, which I really appreciate just taking time to reflect through this medium. But also, I just really hope to share insights from other people. And I learned so much from this podcast. I started this in January of 2020, not knowing what the world would look like by the end of that year, let alone three years later. And I'm so grateful I, I've done it because I've learned so much over this time and I, I really appreciate this time to connect with you all. One of the things that I've been doing the last couple of weeks and it's something that I might continue on doing, I found some real value in it, is I've been sharing three things I've learned in the week on Instagram. So if you can connect with me there, that would be absolutely awesome because I hope I can provide some value for there. But what I was doing when I started that post with the three things I learned is I would simply look back on my week on my camera roll and pick some pictures that resonate with me that stuck out to me some of them are of me some of them are with my family some of them are memes or things I found funny and it made me look back and think about the week and reflect on it and the idea that a picture is worth a thousand words even though I don't share a ton of information in that post on each single picture, it does make me look back at the story of that week. And I always think of my Instagram, my social media as a diary I'm leaving to my kids. So what I wanted to try this month as a little intro is to do three things I learned this month. So I wrote a few things down that made me really think about this month, things I learned. And I'll be honest with you, it's been a, a difficult month. And not that I haven't had great ups, great opportunities, great connections with people, but I've had some challenges that I've had to deal with. Nothing that I can't handle, but just something, some things that I have to deal with. And I'll, I'll share with that more later as I'm able to do. But my family's good. I'm okay. As I said, nothing I can't deal with. So what are those three things that I, I learned um, this month that I wrote down? I wrote just a few notes. And the first one is don't chase people that do not appreciate your time. Often what happens is we connect with people and we can find ourselves texting people and reaching out to them and we don't get the same response back. We don't get the same enthusiasm. And what I've learned, and I'm way better at this, when I take time to connect and reach out to people, they could be having their own things going on, but if I'm not getting the same energy back, it will start to deplete my energy and it'll start to actually make me feel less. And as much as I appreciate people have things going on, maybe it's just not a good time for them to connect with you as well. But that being said, I'm not gonna put energy into not only things, but people that don't give me the same energy back. Because what will happen is I will start to doubt myself and think less of myself through that process. So I was just thinking about that this past week and it was actually not because I had felt some negativity, but the opposite. In the past, that's happened definitely. But some of the people I've connected with since, um, I've moved to Orlando have been phenomenal and make me feel absolutely great and give me energy in a way that I haven't experienced from new connections in a long time. And it's really something I really appreciated. And I wanted to share that. Maybe I should have focused on that being more a positive post, but I think sometimes it's great to kind of connect and be lifted up by others. But it also reminds us that our time is so limited in who we connect with, that if you're not feeling better when you connect with somebody, 
it often takes something away from ourselves. And, and that's a rule I have for myself. If I don't feel better after connecting with people continuously, then I make the choice not to um, go out of my way to connect with them because I want to spend my time in connections and relationships that make me better because when they make me better, it's better for my kids, it's better for my family. So that's one of the takeaways that I had this week. So I don't know if I'm just rambling on. And by the way, if you're watching on YouTube, I have this red thing. I think Georgia actually wrote on my nose. So <laughs> that's a thing. Second lesson I learned from this month. And I heard this either on a podcast or read on Instagram. I don't know. But it was just really good. I really appreciate it. And it said that forgiveness is more for you than it is for other people. I just really love that. When I was listening to whoever was saying this, and I do remember listening to it in a podcast or something. When we don't forgive other people for things that have happened past, and it's not saying that they haven't done something wrong, that you're not validated in feeling something negative. When we don't forgive them, it's kind of a weight we carry on ourselves and that person could not even be thinking about it, having no issue with it, and we're still holding on and it's weighing us down. And I've thought about that in my past. Some of the people that I really struggle with couldn't forgive. And when I said, you know what, I'm gonna let that go. I'm not gonna be bothered by it. And it was, it did nothing for them and seemingly everything for me. They don't know and sometimes, you can forgive someone without them knowing that, if that makes sense. Because that truly lifts that weight off your shoulders. And I just heard that. And not only did it remind me of how powerful it's been in my past when I've done that, it's also reminded me in the future, if I feel that, that I can't carry that weight of being bothered by someone else's past actions, as much as I can be validated in feeling that way, I have to learn to move on. So that was something that really stuck out to me. The last one I want to share is one that I heard on my run this morning. Now, the last few Sundays, probably I think about 10 in a row, I basically ran a half marathon distance or more, and I've really been pushing myself. What I'll typically do is I'll, I'll listen to a podcast, uh, sports-related, news-related for part of it. In the last couple of weeks, I've been listening to yeah, You Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. And if you know anything about David Goggins, like you will feel uh, <laughs> you will feel you can go through a brick wall after you listen to him. And as I was in this run, and there's I'm very specific about this. I'll listen to the podcast first because that's when I tend to have most of my energy. Then as I'm starting to feel a little bit tired, I put on the, the audio book by David Goggins. And one of the things that he said right at the moment when I was feeling exhausted, he said, when you feel things are getting hard, that's when you actually push back harder. And I was just about ready to start walking to kind of give up my run. And it was weird because it was said right in that moment. And it is totally of the mind sometimes when we struggle with things. It's not necessarily a physical thing. It is our mind wearing out. And as soon as he said that, I pushed harder at the time and honestly had no issue finish my run at a good pace. I was really proud of that. And there's so many things in life that as soon as things get hard, it's super easy to walk away and ignore those things. And we talk about resiliency. I talked about resiliency really in depth in both Innovator's Mindset and Innovates of the Box. And we often talk about that with our students, but don't necessarily demonstrate ourselves. We, we encourage our kids that when things get hard, when we struggle with things, you have to have the mentality, that mindset to kind of push through. But then I've also, and I've been guilty of this myself, we try to learn something new, get frustrated with it and say, you know what, that's not valuable. I don't want to use that because it's hard for us. And I think when that, right when that point where things get hard, if you learn to actually push rather than pull back, not to a point of injury or anything ridiculous, but obviously a lot of times we have that energy and we pretend we don't. 
And when you just push through, it makes us better for all the other challenges that we have throughout our days, throughout our weeks, throughout our months. So I just want to share those three learnings. As I said, I'm, I'm doing this, the three learnings on Instagram as well. I'd love for you to connect with me over in that space. And I hope you got something out of this, but if it was terrible and useless to you, I promise you you'll get something out of these um, amazing guests that I have joining me from this last month. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. The root word of discipline is discerna, which is a Latin word, which means disciple, to learn and to teach. So what are we modeling? And that's good discipleship. And what are we teaching in, in our processes? And I believe that we teach with consequences. Like there has to be consequences that takes place. Logical consequences and natural consequences. Punitive consequences is something where you're disconnecting the consequence to the behavior. So true restorative practices with discipline as a teaching tool utilizes consequences as a, a teaching aspect but doesn't remove the behavior from the consequence, which punitive does. So if a kid gets into, let's say, a, a fight into the school, yes, there may be a suspension needed, and I believe in suspensions. I think that sometimes they're utilized for a way to keep the environment safe, and that's something that we need in education. But what do we do after that suspension? Because even before the podcast, we talked about, George, you know, the differentiation of even the consequences in homes, right? Like mm -hmm. one family may give this type of consequence. This family may give this consequence. And we don't have control over those things. What we have control over is the school culture and the environment. Mm -hmm. So when that student returns from a suspension, are they doing steps towards making things right with who they impacted? Are they learning a skill gap? You know, what I did at my high school after a student had their second fight, they would go with our counselors for every Tuesday and Thursday for three months in a row. They'd grab their lunch. They would meet with the counselors and work in a small group on aggression replacement training, which is pretty much anger management. So for three months, they would work Tuesday and Thursday with their lunch to build that skill up. And that's a good logical consequence. It wasn't just a suspension. Now you're done. It's a suspension. And now let's see if there's a skill gap. Let's reinforce that skill gap and let's repair any harm that took place at the same time. Yeah. And like the, the idea of like, just like, here's this action, here's this consequence is something that I've always struggled with. And I always, always give this analogy to my staff. I'd say like, think about your speeding, right? And a cop pulls you over and says, do you know why I pulled you over? Well, cause I'm speeding. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden the cop writes you a ticket for speeding and like not having conversation with you or anything yeah. and then gives you the ticket and nine times out of 10, what does the person think? Stupid cop, yeah. right? Like they're, they're mad at the cop for them doing the wrong thing because it's just like, here's what you did. Here's the issue. And so is there like, I understand that. And I'm not like, that's not something that I'm like, I get that, but that's how I didn't want to be is that you're actually, you want person, the, the, the person that's actually making the, the action, you know, having issue. And you know, something I really did that was simple. Um, and it was like, super easy for me um when i would do this with students when something would go wrong i would just ask the question why are you here today right and i would just ask that question and i would sit and wait and a lot of times the reason i would ask that question is i would say like because this is the thing with with ha what happens in schools a lot of times like i would have some information from a teacher but the kid wouldn't know what i knew so sometimes they would tell me way more stuff. I'm like, oh my God, that's like way worse than what we knew, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so then, and so they would tell, and I would sit and wait, like I would be patient with it. And the first thing I didn't want to do is say, well, I heard you did this and this and this and this, because their, their focus is more on how I'm a jerk, how they don't like me, as opposed to like listening to themselves. And so they would go through that process. And then after they would do this, I would say, okay, what would you do if you were me? And you're trying to get them, and, I, and you're trying to get them to figure out the pathway forward for themselves. And and this is like most teachers know this. A lot of kids are way harder on themselves than the teacher would actually be. And I don't know, like Valerie, did you see that? You know, kind of in your role as an administrator. 
Um, like, how did you kind of use some of these practices in the work that you did before you, you took over a direct, as director of partnerships? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things as a teacher, I always um, prided myself in building relationships with kids and building that community in the classroom so students felt safe and students were able to, you know, share and discuss. Um, another thing was, uh, again, in building the relationships with the students and understanding where they were coming from, it was always about teaching them and not just punishing them. Like right. you said, you know, there's a process. And I know that in the beginning, and I'm sure a lot of new teachers out there can agree, you're trying to fix the problem. And then it becomes more about you and less about them. And mm. so I think when you give them the time to process what's actually happened and, you know, Dr. Belinda George gave me this advice. She said, you know, try and asking the student, do you want to make things better or do you want to make things worse? And when I began asking that question to students, they always chose that they wanted to make things better. And the thing was, was it offered them the, the time to process what happened and they were also able to say, hey, you know, she's not just going to punish me. She's going to figure out what is wrong and then get to we're going to be able to solve that together versus, you know, go to ISS. I don't want to hear it. This is what I saw. This is what I heard and move on. And I think that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough time to do that. We don't give ourselves as teachers. We don't give ourselves as administrators because we have so much going on. But um, we definitely get that time back later if we continue to build relationships and go along with um, handling situations, challenging situations, such like that. Well, I, I got to ask you this because this is like an you know, side conversation. Dr. Belinda George, I swear that I, is Dr. Belinda George, was she's doing like Facebook readings or something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I actually wrote about her and I think in one of my books. Really? Yeah, she does yeah, Tucked yeah. in Tuesdays experiencing the heartbreak of being passed up. And mm. I was kind of, it was a trajectory. I was in a smaller, smallish district and I was assistant superintendent for five years. And it was like, I was next in line for that superintendent position. Mm -hmm. um, I had solid relationships, right? With staff, mm -hmm. community, um, with um, the board. And it was nothing short but shocking when I applied, I went for it. And, you know, it's a small community. Everybody knows everybody. There was a lot of embarrassment, you know, and just kind of humiliated. Mm -hmm. um, there was some political, um, of course, when decisions are made like this, right? right. Some political and, um, you know, backlash, community revolt. And I, at the time, thought to myself, okay, I have two choices here. Number one, I can stay and I can like be victim to a district that says, we don't want you, but still stay. Right. Or I can pick myself off the ground because during those first few days, George, as I'm sure that you and I know certainly other leaders have experienced, you're in like this deep, dark place of, my world's been turned upside down and I don't even know really what my purpose is because I thought my purpose was being here. Right. And now that I'm being told it's not, I got to kind of redefine things in yep. my own mind. And so that's where I was like, okay, I, I did the grieving. I did the crying. I did the, you know, the behind the scenes, just outright pissed off piece. And then once I got to that point of, I can't stay, but I don't know where mm -hmm. it was like the opportunities just kept coming. Right. And I picked where I'm currently at the charter schools and it has been absolutely phenomenal, but I wouldn't have even had the opportunity to write, to speak, right. to do these other things. If I would have been in that role of superintendent in that district. It just wouldn't have happened. It's amazing. You know, I have a very good friend. And if that friend is listening right now, text me that you're listening because that went through exactly the same thing that you're talking about. And they were by far the best person for the position. And it was like the politics and not focus on what is best for the school dis district, what's not best for the teachers, but you know, what makes the 
the board look really good or, you know, or, you know, there may be fear of some, you know, that happens and it's unfortunate. And I think that sometimes it's, it's a sign that you, it, it, Hey, it's time to go and serve another place. So like when, when educators say this to me, like, Oh, it's really hard to leave these kids, you know, like I've invested so much in them. I'm like, but there are other kids who need support as well. Right. 100%. Like it's not, it's, yep. you're, and within a week, I promise you, you'll be like, wow, I can never leave these kids. Right. And that's how we feel. Cause we, there's a emotional connection to our communities and things like this. But I learned that I, I don't stay in places where, you know, I think this is a really important aspect. I've been talking a lot about this over the last couple of years. Specifically, there is a difference between the idea of being valued and feeling valued. And if uh, leaders don't actually make that connection between the importance that people feel valued, mm -hmm. you can say all you want. Mm -hmm. But when you, you develop them, and I, I can't remember the book, uh, but I read it, said you should never hire someone externally to a leadership position, uh, unless they are 30% better. Now, how you measure that than anybody else, because there's all those things you have to teach them about the culture, about the community and things like that too, that if they're not like head and, you know, shoulders above, way better than anybody else, then, then it doesn't really make sense to do that. Yeah. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. And I know, uh, specifically people that I've connected with that have felt passed over, and not for the right reasons. When we were talking before, and you shared this when we we had met um, as we were planning for July, um, you, you really kind of focus on this idea of know your impact. And this is a, a big theme for you in Fort Bend ISD. And I know something that you take really personally. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, what you mean by know your impact and, and why it's so important to the work that you do today? Well, first of all, I think there's never been a time, at least in my career, where it's more important that we let teachers and educators know the impact that they're making. Uh, a lot of people have retired early after COVID. They've left the profession. They're stressed out by student behaviors that are different than prior to COVID. So we've had all of that that's impacted our profession somewhat negatively. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to let them know they make a difference. So we started with our theme. And then I shared with you about Virtus Wilson reaching out to me. And so when he did that and I connected with him, then I thought, wow, he's let me know I made that impact on him um, just by my kindness and look, finding him. And because back in the day, we didn't know where kids went. I had to get the phone number, talk to the grandmother, get permission to drive out there, pick him up. And it was a whole different thing just so I could have closure. So he could have closure yeah. because that's not healthy for kids. But what it made me think of is what am I doing to let educators know that made a difference to me? So I reached out to a woman named Pauline Barker. And she was my supervising teacher, in Missouri State, when I was in college. And she was a second grade teacher. And that's where I did my student teaching. And her classroom was just so fun. And she was so positive. And I stayed in touch with her for a while. But then I lost touch. And it made me think, I wonder if I can find her. And yeah. so I went through the Alumni Association and found her because the lab school was on campus. So it was connected to the university. And uh, they would only reach out to her with my name. They wouldn't obviously let me have her number. So that yeah. took a while. But one day my phone rings and it's her. And we had the best conversation and she remembered me. And uh, just she was she was most proud, honestly. Not so much that I was a superintendent, but that I got a doctorate. <laughs> That's what she was proud of, that I went on with my education. And um, But here's what she said to me, and I think this is so powerful, and I've told this to my staff. She said how much it meant that I reached out and told her she made a difference. She, she taught me how to teach. And I'm still teaching today. It's just that my classroom is ginormous. Mm -hmm. And... Um, she said, you know, when you're 83, no one tells you that you made a difference much anymore. And I'll never forget her saying that to me on the phone. And so I've written her several times and I've sent her some communications from our school district. And uh, just always, I always say, you, I told her about who's your Virtus that I asked my leaders, who's your Mrs. Barker, because I want them to tell me, hey, who are you reaching out to? It's not just about us sitting around and waiting on a child to tell us we made a difference. It's about what are we doing for that pay it forward moment. 
And so we spend a lot of time, every leadership meeting, we do that. She is so proud of that. She is so proud of that. And so um, she's Mrs. Barker and uh, she, she taught me how to teach and I'm forever grateful. This is from the end of the book and it really resonated with me. And wherever you are on your life's path, I hope that after reading this book, you accept all that's happened because you also know that none of what has happened in the past predicts the future. Every moment, it's its own adventure. So you own that next moment and the next and the next. And you keep going. What I thought about when I read this quote. I was so obsessed when, you know, in my career on becoming a principal when I was assistant principal. I basically had one day as assistant principal and I knew by the second, I want to be a principal. So I spent a lot of my time basically focusing on that next step in my career. And what actually happens when you do that, when you're so focused on what's happening in the future, or sometimes when you're so stuck on what's happened in the past, you're actually not making the best out of the present moment and assessing this. And I was offered a job um, as a principal, you know, early on, and I just knew it wasn't the right fit for me. And I was terrified that me saying no to something that I wanted, because there's so many other factors in that situation that weren't good for me at the time, uh, where it was, you know, what it would do for my mental health, uh, because of the, the increase in drive time, just a bunch of other factors. I was terrified. And what I actually stepped back and reassessed is if I'm an assistant principal at this school that I truly love with people I truly love, and I don't take a principalship, is that actually a horrible thing? Sometimes just assessing and appreciating the situation that you're in because it's good. Like now, if your situation's horrible, that's a different story. But sometimes we actually don't acknowledge the good we're in right now because we're so obsessed on making the future better. But what I have learned over and over and over again is basically when you focus on doing the best thing that you need to do in the situation, the future will take care of itself. I focused on being the best assistant principal. I, I stopped focusing on becoming a principal. I focused on becoming the best assistant principal I could possibly be. And because of my performance, that actually opened up a job as a principal way quicker than if I would actually been obsessed with becoming a principal and focus solely on that. When I became a principal, I was way better at it. And I was so focused on being the best principal I could be. All of a sudden, an, an opportunity opened up where I started speaking and then started, you know, um, helping other uh, leaders in the school district, doing something I, I couldn't even imagine that was there. I'd always want to be a superintendent. I remember having a conversation with one of my former superintendents who was absolutely amazing. And she said to me, uh, I don't think you're going to be a superintendent. It's not because you don't have the ability, but because I just see different things for you. And I didn't have any clue what that would be, but she saw something I didn't. So I just focused on doing the best what I could at the moment. Being able to ask for help is a display of strength and confidence. It shows an understanding of your abilities and an awareness of what's happening around you. People who refuse to ask for help, who believe they can handle everything on their own, are deceiving themselves and doing a disservice to those around them. Now, I have been blessed to have people in my life that have helped me significantly and helped me when I struggled the most. Uh, many of you might know this story. I basically um, had, had a, a mental breakdown. I don't, I don't know if it's a nervous breakdown, mental breakdown. I was just done. And I remember... Basically, my deputy superintendent, Kelly Wilkins, who I've talked about 10 million times because she's the most incredible leader I've ever had. She basically just said, you got to go home. Like you got to, and not like go home for the day. Like you need some time off because you are, this is not going on a good path for you. And not like in a, 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 um, a punishing way or anything like that. But in a like, if, if, if you don't get this, you know, sorted, it's not gonna be two weeks that you're gone for you. You might be the end of your career. Right. And so she gave me that time and she never made me feel uncomfortable. And so she gave me an extent of that help and thank goodness. And I always trusted her that when I struggled, I could call her and say like, Hey, I'm struggling with this. When I was a principal, there was lots of things new to me. And I always knew that I could call and say like, Hey, I'm struggling with this situation. Here's something that, um, and, that I, I don't really understand. And I, it was so, I was so appreciative that um, people are willing to help. And you get, you're surprised with that. What frustrates people sometimes 
is when you don't know and you just try to go it on your own when you could have simply asked. And sometimes the mistakes and the mess that you make, it takes 10 times longer to fix than it would have been just to ask the question in the first place. The first quote really hit me when I read this. Uh, Gadara shares, former Navy captain David, David Marquette says that in too many organizations, the people at the top have all the authority and none of the information, while the people on the front line have all the information and none of the authority. Does that sound familiar in education? Wow, that hit me. And I really think about this, that there's often this divide about what educators are doing in classrooms and what's going on at central office. And there is a place, to be honest with you, where people at central office, people in administration, they're very valuable to the work that's actually done in the classrooms and vice versa. What's happening in the classrooms, the authority part, there's huge benefits. And so it's not saying that one doesn't need the other, but in my opinion, it's actually how do we utilize the experiences and um, opportunities that each group has to kind of connect with one another. And something that I've said forever is that if you make decisions in the classrooms, then you better be in classrooms. This book is amazing. I, I really loved it. And um, I would suggest, especially if you're in school leadership, to check out this book if you're an educator and really try to make your connections to what Gadara is talking about in the book to what we do in education. There's so much crossover here. I would highly suggest it. Book study would be absolutely fantastic. And that's the thing with these book studies. I, I'm telling you a whole of this. Uh, I don't know Will Gadara, but I, I may, and maybe I'm a bias in this because he talks about his experience of running a restaurant. And if you know anything about me, uh, my parents were immigrants to Canada uh, from Greece. They met actually in a, a small city called Saskatoon, Saskatchewan uh, in Canada. And they actually worked in the restaurant industry and then they uh, had their own restaurant. And so I, I basically kind of grew up in a restaurant. Uh, I spent most of my lunches as a kid going to the restaurant watching the Flintstones I spent my evenings there and it, it just was a really interesting experience and there's so much that I learned from my parents and how they serve people how they made people feel really welcome and a lot of times when I talk about education I think about the family restaurant and the experience my parents created for people coming in and how synonymous that was with the work that I try to do in education and still try to do to this day and how important that is to me.